We typically do this training for law enforcement only for basically for our own people. This is our first venture out into uh, the civilian world, so to speak. Um, most of our programs based on Department of Homeland Security and FBI training protocols. Uh, we're basically here to, to help you understand how to survive this thing. All right. Uh, like I said, I'm the, I'm the Special Agent Supervisor for the Counterterrorism Squad. What does that mean? Well, the see something, say something tips that come in, the, when we find stuff on social media that's threatening, my guys will go out, try to vet it out. We do a lot of other stuff with, uh, with, fi with uh, threat financing that's leaving the country, coming into the country. You know, we're looking for the we're looking for the guys that are making the bombs in the in the garage and, and all that other stuff. So the pro this program's been open about two years, so we're still trying to figure out what we do. Uh, I've been a as she said, high liability instructor, I've been a firearms instructor, defensive tactics instructor, officer survival instructor. I'm gonna let Jeff give his own pedigree. I've got 26 years in the military. Uh, 13 of those on active duty, and including two tours in Afghanistan and another 13 uh, in, the, in the National Guard. So we come here with, very, with varied and hopefully pretty extensive experience. This is going to be very informal. Uh, we're going to start off with a video after we get done running our mouths. And then, uh, then at that point, we'll try to ex uh, put some other stuff out there for you to help you out. With, with some survival kind of techniques. And then uh, it, we're going to open it up to the floor. And please, any questions you have, don't walk out the door without getting an answer. And if we don't have the answer for you, give us a business card or give us a contact number. We'll find the answer and get back with you. OK, Jeff? <clears throat> Jeff Herb, I work with Paul. Uh, he's my supervisor. 22 years in law enforcement, uh, certified active shooter instructor. Through ALERT, there's several programs. ALERT is acknowledged by the FBI as one of the kind of industry standards. And the big thing that we want to convey to you guys is uh, we have a very broad and uh, diverse group of students. So it's difficult for us to kind of find that niche. So we're going to give you kind of the 10,000 foot view and, and, and address um, active shooter, also mass casualty threat, which is kind of the same thing because it doesn't always have to involve a gun. It could be an explosive, it could be a, a big rider truck. It could be somebody with a knife. Uh, the, threat, the threat is kind of the same. But uh, we're going to try and kind of give you some best practices that apply to all the industry uh, uh, that's, that's uh, represented here as students. And like uh, Paul said, we really want you guys to take advantage of picking our brain. Um, that's kind of what, what works best for the class is when we get that feedback. And, and sometimes other students will benefit from each other, from their, from their questions. Our phone number is up here. Uh, Please do not hesitate. Uh, guys, this is the shortest class that Paul and I have ever taught on this subject matter is eight hours. Uh, we even have a, a three-day version of this. So compressing all of that information into two hours is obviously a, a, you know, going to be a time crunch. We'll do the best that we can. Um, sometimes when people get back to their offices or their homes, they're like, man, I forgot. I wanted to talk about this or I wanted to ask about that. Take advantage of that number if you want to jot it down. And uh, you guys... Do not hesitate to call us, whether it's tomorrow or six months from now. If something comes up, if you have a question, or maybe somebody, you hear an alternate teaching point, hey, I went to another class and they said do this, We please pick our brain. We've been doing this a couple days and we want you guys to leave with some of the knowledge that we have. And then uh, one other housekeeping uh, thing is um, for any folks that need to use the restroom, right outside here is the atrium, which is where the refreshments were. On either side of the uh, back wall here, to the left is the ladies' room, and to the right is the men's room. So feel free to uh, to leave if you need to use the restroom. Yes, ma'am. What door do you want us to exit? If you, need to... you know, if you guys can use either one of these side doors right here, the hallways will take you out. That way, it won't uh, you know disrupt the the video or anything like that. So thank you. One other point. Uh, this is really a dynamic kind of a program. Um, after Columbine, the conventional wisdom in law enforcement was you wait, you put together a four-man entry team, and then you go after the shooter. Current doctrine is, if you hear gunfire, you go to the sound of the guns. Whether you're by yourself or you got ten people behind you. you know? 
So it's, it's a dynamic program, and what we teach today, you know, like you said, in six months it may change. We're going to give you what we, what we believe to be best practices as of, as of today. We're going to start with a video. I think this particular, there are several videos out there, guys. Actually, uh, too, if you want to write this down, uh, Run, Hide, Fight is the DHS protocol. And there's actually a lot of open source information and videos that you can get on YouTube. But this is one of, again, we have two hours. But Paul and I felt this is the best one because it kind of touches three different segments of uh, you've got active shooters that, that attack schools. Uh, you know, you've got office building attacks and things like that. So there, we're going to cover three that should hopefully uh, cover the the broad spectrum here. On the morning of August 1st, 1966, shots ring out from the observation deck of the clock tower on the University of Texas campus. By the time the gunman is killed by Austin police, 13 students lay dead, with another 31 wounded. It marks the infamous beginning of the modern era of mass shootings in America. The number of these events continues to rise throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s. In the spring of 1999, the mass shooting of students at Columbine High School becomes the latest notorious monster. Police set a perimeter and help students escape, but wait for SWAT before entering the building. More students die as a result, prompting changes to how law enforcement respond to what's become known as active shooter incidents. Over the next 17 years, active shooters claim more than 1,500 casualties across the U.S in towns large and small, in government facilities, schools, places of worship, and most often, places of business. During this time, protocols evolve. Enhanced techniques move first responders to the shooters and victims faster, help manage victim families, witnesses, the media, and evidence collection all focused on controlling the inevitable chaos. Just after midnight on July 20th, 2012, a lone gunman enters the Century 16 Theater in suburban Aurora, Colorado. Police arrived on the scene 90 seconds after the first 911 call. Within minutes, the suspect is in custody and attention turns to the victims. The most that was ever aired on the radio to our fire units was four victims. We arrived to people running out of the theater covered in blood. We had police officers coming to us asking for help, asking to get this patient out of there, um, even asking for our breathing apparatus because they wanted to go to the theater where tear gas was being sprayed. This is the command to start was me standing on the curb in front of the theater with my radio and cell phone. The other lieutenant would 
come and check in with me periodically, and then he would go back into the building and check on stuff. That night, the fire has their channel, we have our channel, so communications is having to relay everything. I did ask for fire command to meet me there. That did not happen for some time. These people were going to die soon if we didn't do something. Yeah, pull them up, get in the car, get out of here. With fire overwhelmed with walking wounded, the police decide to break protocol <laughs> and self transport. It's an extraordinary circumstance. Policy can't cover all of that. Twelve people died that night. But the death toll would have been higher without the officer's decision to transport. Of the 70 that were wounded, 17 were critical. 15 of those victims arrived at the hospitals in police cars. Every person that had survivable injuries on that scene survived. But the shooter planned for even more victims at his Paris Street apartment. He had set it up as a booby trap, hoping for first responders to get there, trigger an explosion there, draw the remaining officers to his apartment, and then he could do his acts at the, at the theater. We had a meeting with the bomb teams and the fire leadership and myself. I said, you know, we're not, we're not going to let this bastard win. He's not going to get the building. And those guys came back in the morning, and they spent 12 to 14 hours very slowly very carefully taking that apart. All of our training should conclude that there might be a secondary device. We checked all the cars. It really got us thinking just how far out do we need to go to check for stuff. What I found on scene is I couldn't even use my cell phone to call the chief or to contact my other PIO because it was just ringing off the hook. And he was, of course, experiencing the same thing. So we got to the point where our cell phones were useless. And early on, I remember asking for spare cell phones that we could use to be able to, to call command personnel that we needed to speak to. What I realized later um, is that I could have put on a do not disturb feature, which would have helped immensely that night, because there's no way that we could have filled all those calls. The thing that helped us the most was using social media. We would put out when we were going to do our interviews when our first press conference was, and so they had answers. They knew the timeline, when to expect. With every tragedy, law enforcement must manage the rush of victim families and friends to the scene by establishing a staging area. Here, victim advocates provide critical resources and emotional support, but most importantly, they provide unvarnished information. They sort of admit that you need mental health counselors to rush to a scene to provide support. And the reality is that most people don't need mental health care. They need information. Information is flying so quickly through the media, through Twitter, through all kinds of social media. It presents a real challenge for law enforcement and for families. It's not unusual for social media to report initial casualty numbers before family members can be notified. Maybe there are 10 or 15 or 20 casualties, and then all of a sudden you have 10 or 15 or 20 families that are looking for their loved ones. A lot of state medical and local medical examiners have to do a forensic identification. In some extraordinary situations, however, we have learned that extraordinary measures must be taken to provide support to families. You can say it looks like there are 20 deceased, there are 20 of you. It looks like your daughter, your son, your husband has been identified preliminarily. You can make a presumptive death notification and then caveat it if you have to. Say this is not certain, it's the best we can do right now, we need your patience. But to just leave family sort of in limbo, hanging there and not knowing you know, what's going on while the media is getting information, the last thing you want any of us should want in law enforcement is for families to get information about the death or injury of a loved one through media. What I was experiencing was media from around the globe completely overwhelming our city. And I knew it was just a matter of time that those people would find out who these families were. 
and they were completely overwhelmed these families. So Carlson decided to tap her membership in a statewide PIO organization for support. I have all of my professional PIO organization that's wanting to help. They've been calling me, asking me what I can do. And as the light bulb went off, I know what they can do. They're going to help these families. Carlson assigned one volunteer PIO to each family. These professional PIOs provided a buffer from the media so that these families could grieve. We readily recognize that communication could have been better, which we've since rectified through policy protocol, actually to the extent we reprogrammed our radios to have each other's talk channels on it. Now, when we get dispatched to a scene that we think could be a, a critical incident, a shooting, or, or something like that, we go to our police channel and we talk to the police commander before we even arrive on scene. And so that's really our first objective now when we're going to a, a joint response, is to establish you by command from the very beginning. Even though I have the most respect for the folks that were in the theater that night, and obviously our 12 murder victims, the victimization reaches far beyond that. My wife was a, a new patrol sergeant. She was working swim shift that night. So her jacket, her hat, her police bag, they were all bloody. We drove home together that morning to the day that I gave that vehicle up. Uh, every time she got into that car, she would look at me and say, this car smells like blood. One of our officers, experienced officer, been on a long time, um, and he walked up to me and he said, LT, I think I had to carry a little girl out of the theater. I think she's dead. And uh, you could tell he was hurting inside. You know, I know from working with 9-11, there were people who were in shock for three or four years. It takes four to eight years for most people just to return to some stabilization after a terrorism event or some other mass casualty. We have several officers that we've been watching in the organization. We do know that there's some alcoholism involved. We've had some marital problems. Um, our worst fears are that we'll have some suicidal uh, Incidents. We need to relieve those crews after a traumatic incident. Unfortunately for us, the shooter's apartment happened so quickly after we didn't have the time to do that, and it was kind of like an emergency that never ended. Then the next day, the president decided he wanted to represent the country to come here, so then we ended up with the presidential detail as well. My chief offers to allow the SWAT team to opt out of that. I said, absolutely not. This is our city. Aurora SWAT will take care of this. As a leader, I'm not sure that was a great decision, other than um, the pride involved. I think the guys wanted to come back. They felt a need to come back. And they're good officers. They want to come back and do their duty. A suggestion would be maybe to let these people come back, but not put them in some of the enforcement roles we wanted them to be in. Or maybe to marry them up with an officer that wasn't involved, so that now they have somebody that can kind of watch over them, make sure they're doing OK emotionally. I think a lot of our first responders really feel more comfortable talking to people who are doing the job. We actually created our own peer support team uh, from the ground up. I think the single biggest lesson learned is to take care of people. <clears throat> Understanding that they've just seen something that they'll never forget. Washington, D.C., September 16th. 2013. A cleared contract employee arrives at building 197 in the Navy Yard. Passing by security, he proceeds to the fourth floor and removes a sawed-off shotgun from his backpack. Just over a minute later, 911 dispatchers receive their first urgent call. Just six minutes after the first shots are fired, 10 of the 12 victims are already dead. The suspect then encounters his first uh, group of law enforcement officers, and the first of several different gun battles begins. The suspect escapes after this first exchange and his demeanor changes from hunter to hunter.
Meanwhile, FBI Special Agent David Goldkopf arrives on the scene. A veteran of many active shooter incidents, he finds access roads clogged with fire trucks, police cars, media, and unmarked vehicles. I had never been faced with a volume of people both responding to and fleeing from an incident uh, in the way they were coming out of the, the Navy Yard. There were people dressed in shorts and t-shirts, throwing on bulletproof vests, with long guns to people dressed in traditional, well-marked law enforcement uniforms stating who they were, what agency they were with, and actually looking at more like a traditional police officer. In all, 117 officers from 10 different agencies entered Building 197 in pursuit of the gunman. At that point, we were still in the middle of a chaotic situation. All the radio traffic coming out was so conflicting that it was very tough to discern what the subject did or didn't look like. How many subjects were there? How many injuries were there? We have people here towards the scene. The fire alarm was going off. It was drowning out the officers' transmissions. It was difficult for them to hear their radio. So one of the benefits of being in incident command with multiple agencies is each agency could talk to their own people and then we could attempt to deconflict what was going on. The Special Operations Commander from MPD was there. He and I know each other. We were on the trunk of his car, along with representatives from Capitol Police, Federal Protective Services, United States Park Police, and CIS. But we had all worked together for the most part, so when you looked up and saw a friendly face, you didn't have to ask why you were here and what you could offer. You just said, here's what I am doing, and they said, okay, you keep working on that and continue to work the situation from there. It was approximately an hour from the time the first shots were fired until the shooter was actually killed by police, which is one of the longer running after shooter incidents across the country. After the shooter was down, that's when things got really complicated. We have to stop and sort through these people coming out and determine who has more information, who's a witness, you know, who could potentially be a shooter. Unified Command struggled to deal with witness management, crime scene processing, victim assistance, and media management. We had done it all before, and we did it really well in the last crisis, but nobody put in a policy, and there was no protocol. It was determined at a certain point that the FBI was going to lead the crime scene processing, but it was going to be done jointly with NCIS and MPD as part of those processing teams. Decisions made in Unified Command weren't all that effectively transmitted all the way down to the troops along the way. Working through that challenge of that information flow, it does create some hard feelings initially um, when there's a lack of understanding of what's going on on all parts. If you don't take those lessons that you learn from every incident immediately and put them in policy or protocols so that, so that People coming behind you know how to do those things or have a roadmap for that. That's not leadership. Every single event, we should be improving. And I was so frustrated that we didn't, we missed that opportunity. After actions are good tools to use, um, but an honest after action is a better tool. The beat officers, the guys on the street, are very happy to finish an incident and browbeat each other about what they did wrong and what they did right, and they move forward and learn from it. But getting that message from the officer on the street to the agency head and across agencies can be tough sometimes because we don't want to offend each other. Trying to open those doors and understand that we're all trying to help each other is key to moving forward and learning from these situations. There's three things I always look for. Um, where is our policy? Uh, where is our training need to be fixed or improved? and what equipment should we have that we didn't have. If you're a command level official in a crisis, I need you to automatically go into that mode. Assign the staging area, set up the traffic perimeter, make sure that you've got a staging area for the news media. These steps are all critical to stabilizing and managing the scene. <clears throat> Sorting all that out when you've got an active gunman shooting is very difficult unless you have plans for yourself. Flexibility in the training is really critical. We had trained under scenarios that were familiar, but weren't flexible. Officers pursuing the shooter understood access would be difficult inside a secure facility. Those officers really thought on their feet under extraordinary stress. 
They used the slain security guard's access card to swipe through locked doors, then prop them open as they went. So that's the kind of scenarios that we now incorporate into our training. We put small details around in an environment and challenge the officers to use that type of creativity to make sure they get the scenario safely. Two of our officers were shot in this incident. We believe because the shooter could hear the radio transmissions. There's no reason for that. I heard another chief give a lecture on an active shooter where he said, I wish we had earpieces. And I wrote that down when he said it. And then a couple months later, I have this scenario, and all I can think of is why didn't I get those earpieces? Why didn't I go back that day and change the policy to get those earpieces? Yes, ma'am. Missing earpieces weren't the only equipment issue that day. In most jurisdictions, the police and fire are dispatched, the period of dispatches that we've had. And what we didn't know and we missed was that inside the walls of the Washington area, those streets are not in CAD. Listening to that after, I thought to myself, how many other places in our city? How many college campuses? How many hospital campuses? How many other closed campuses do not have street names in our computer-aided dispatch system? Those are the kinds of things that you're not going to think of that's not automatic, and that's why I think it's important for people to look at the after action and look at the unique things that we discovered that are so easily fixable and are so common in so many other jurisdictions. Two months later, law enforcement would be put to the test again at one of the nation's busiest airports. On the morning of November 1st, 2013, it was just another day at Los Angeles International Airport. When sounds of gunfire were heard in Terminal 3, a 23-year-old man brandishing a rifle opened fire at a security checkpoint before running up an escalator and shooting two other TSA agents and a civilian in the battle screen. The first officers arrived on the scene within 90 seconds, pursuing the suspect to the Virgin America gates. So their training to respond in an active shooter incident is to respond immediately, form up, and then proceed directly to the suspect. They're not to stop at victims, they're not to stop anywhere, they're to stop the carnage and to stop the threat that the shooter poses. One officer's cover fire allowed two others to flank the suspect and shoot him. I think that their superior tactics confused the shooter in our particular case and led to a successful conclusion. It took them four minutes and eight seconds from the time they were notified to the time they were able to neutralize the suspect and take him into custody. So you get a thousand people that are running to get out of the terminal all at the same time. The vast majority of them fled out onto the airfield. There were no instructions offered by anyone of any capacity, whether official or not, on the safe directions to go. As officers began clearing hundreds of passengers from the tarmac, they were surprised to find a group of Virgin America employees still hard at work. I wasn't aware at the time that Virgin America had an operating center within the terminal. And so when the officers came upon our 24-hour operation center, our local Virgin America operation center, they understandably showed up with intent to simply move everybody out. Well, what they didn't understand is that airlines have to maintain communications with all planes on the ground at any given time. And they pushed back indicating that no, they really needed to stay there and to do their particular work. So without my knowledge, an officer took it upon himself to figure out, okay, you make a compelling argument, we'll post somebody here and we'll keep you safe while you operate that piece of it. I'm proud of my officer. They made a lot of decisions that particular day based upon their training and based upon their experience. Some people 
see chaos, that, that things are out of control. And this is not the norm. This is crazy, right? And what I try to teach, and one of the things I stress on a regular basis, is that there is always going to be chaos in any one of these incidents. You just can't help it. If you don't teach people about chaos, when your first responders show up and there is chaos, they won't know how to react to it. That's what you're going to be judged on later on as to how successful you are, is how quickly you can bring that chaos under control. Fire department had set up their rigs 150 or 200 yards away, but I didn't have any representation from the fire department in the command post. And uh, I was told initially by a battalion chief through a, a runner that I had sent down there that they wouldn't be sending anybody uh, to our command post. When I first arrived on scene, I asked the uh, LAFD chief officer if we were in unified command with LAPD, and he said, yes, if we were, but my next question is, where are they? Because one of the tenets of Unified Command is a co-location right next to each other, not five or six, seven hundred yards. A chief officer arrived from the fire department shortly thereafter, and we got a representation to the command force. But it created concern on my part because I knew we had injured people in the airport that we had to deal with. Another key representative to Unified Command was airport operations which manages and maintains 24-7 situational awareness of all aspects of the land and airfield sides of the airport. We had flights that were international and they were not allowed to uh, deplane into the customs area. Uh, we had passengers who were in the terminals that were not allowed to leave. The shooter and catching the suspect was within four minutes, which was a great job from the police department. However, we dealt with impacts for 28 hours after that. And keeping the business open at an airport like LAX is vital. I honestly hadn't really considered how difficult that would be. A few things we had disagreements on, which is normal, um, as long as we can have a healthy conversation and, and a healthy argument. The law enforcement folks were really focused on getting the police vehicles out of the way first before we can open the roadways. They couldn't locate the folks that actually belonged to the cars. Finally, after an argument, I said that it, it's ridiculous that we could continue closing the airport this way because we can't move um, some vehicles. And we ultimately had to tow those vehicles to get them out of the way in order to get the airport back up and running. Major parts of the airport were all shot up. The FBI needed to come in with their evidence collection teams and processed the crime scene. There was a different opinion between the public safety folks and the airport operations of saying this is a criminal site, this is the FBI will never agree, uh, we can't really touch you, you're not going to be able to probably see that terminal open for another week. Um, so that, that's really where I got worried about I really need to start talking business with them of how many airlines are impacted. I mean, Pfizer cancer. Yeah, was also concerned about the 50,000 airport employees and numerous businesses that suffered for every day the airport was closed. We came up with the idea that we will build a wall between the TSA checkpoint and the ticket counters. If the FBI would allow it, to my surprise, the FBI person didn't see any issue with it. As a matter of fact, said, go for it. I'll help you recover it as fast as possible. It was actually a very uh, remarkable and ingenious way of keeping uh, the, the place operating while at the same time making sure that we don't disturb uh, our crime scene and our evidence collection. And the maintenance folks came in and started doing some repairs to the ticket counters that were broken. All the bullet holes that were in the terminal got repaired. Just a day after the shooting, Terminal 3 was reopened for business. When the officers confronted the suspect in this particular case, they were armed with handguns. He was armed with an MP15. They were outgunned. We really do need to make sure that our officers have the equipment that they need to address a life threat. In that way, we're committed to ensuring that every single one of our patrol officers are trained in the use of rifles, and that we have those rifles available to them as quickly as we possibly can, and to forward deploy those rifles in a place where they are accessible uh, to the officers in the event of an emergency. The Brussels attack 
that remind us that oftentimes the threat's going to come from the public side of the airport. It is going to come from somebody dropping somebody off or, or somebody pulling up in a vehicle or a van. Brussels has forced airports to widen their security perimeter using random security screening of cars, bomb sniffing dogs, and other measures. So what are the questions that keep Chief Gannon up at night? How do we continually move forward? How do we adjust to the tactics of terrorists? How do we adjust to the tactics of our own homegrown violent extremists and continually make people feel comfortable that they can come here and fly and that they will be kept safe as we possibly can make them? Training and more training, sets and reps, both from a tactical perspective, an organizational perspective, and a command and control perspective, remains that crucial link to ensure success or ensure our failure. First aid training and medical training has become very important in any type of incident now. We've issued every one of our officers triage kits. If you're in a small jurisdiction, small agency, you don't have any resources, Probably a good idea to reach out to one of your larger law enforcement partners to get the training anyway, because if you have a scenario, you'll be working through that incident together. So training together is the best thing you can do. What do we got? What do we need to do here? The partnerships are super important for when an event like this occurs, because I don't care who you are, you're going to need help, and a lot of it. And actually, since the leaders are being considered for both a joint training facility. So now our police and fire departments actually train in the same facility. We believe that the shooter went stagnant somewhere on the east end of the building. The fire department will do amazing things, and they put out amazing fires, and they do amazing rescues on a regular basis. But they are not used to running into incidents that involve uh, people shooting at them. Police officers, conversely, are very nervous about running into a fire and don't want anything to do with the fire. On the other hand, they will run towards gunshots in half a heartbeat. And so there's a little bit of a conflict there from the cultures of the two agents. All right, we'll join in with these guys. Yep. Under our policy, members are able to and encouraged to embrace extreme personal risk if the <coughs> game is consistent with saving a life. And if you want, yes. go downstairs. <coughs> that became the impetus for what we now call across the country tactical PMS. We actually embed both firefighters and police officers in the same functional group. Got a pulse of breathing. Clear. We create a comfort zone. The firefighters know that we will provide them the protection that they need and that we will provide them the ability to be able to treat, triage, and then transport victims. So they're really our force protection. Um, they're going to make sure that we're going into a situation that's safe. Moving, Moving out. I'm a big believer in that when this novel incident occurs at 2 o'clock in the morning and we get bounced out of bed, that we are not going to rise to the occasion, but we're going to sink to the level of our preparation. Preparation is the only thing we have control over. Rising mass casualty threats in the U.S. and internationally demand that first responders continually improve their tactical and incident management skills. We must learn from every incident. The highest casualty active shooter incident in American history, the Pulse nightclub shooting, highlights the need for scalable resources. The use of a gun from a checked bag at the Fort Lauderdale International Airport emphasizes the need to anticipate the unexpected. Active shooters can be anywhere. They can be in movie theaters. They can be in shopping centers. They can be walking down the middle of the street. Our shooter, no criminal record. No documented mental health history had never come up on our radar screen. First responders must work together to adjust tactics and protocols to respond to and manage these incidents, along with the evolving threat of violent extremist groups. And train, train, train. And that's what this is all about, is providing that confidence level to, uh, to our people, that we all feel confident and comfortable that we're going to do the best we can in an incident. My advice to commanders is uh, that practice component. And practice and do scenarios and tabletops and practice with your partners all the time. 
That's what saved us that night. As well as if you hope never happens, you better train for it. Because it will happen. And it will happen in places you wouldn't expect. Be ready for it. I neglected to, to speak to uh, is that both Jeff and I were present for Pulse. Uh, I was there at 10 o'clock Sunday morning. Jeff, you got there what Sunday night, right? No, no. Uh, Pulse brought the governor over at yeah. 10 30. So we were, both, we were both physically present there. And one of the things that, uh, that I remember from being at Pulse is hearing the cell phones going off inside the facility and thinking that's an unanswered phone call that just ruined somebody's life you know so uh, that's just our two cents worth of, of this uh, other things that that we want to go into is some of the ways that how, you know how do you actually survive one of these things you heard him talk about chaos it is manifest it is all over the place uh, when, what are my other takeaways from Pulse Saw all those big command buses. The operations were going on off the hood of a car. There were so many politicians in the command buses, we couldn't use them. So we were operating off the hood of cars. The PIO from the FBI, two cell phones on the hood of a car. You know, some of the other operations people, the same thing. You know, and that's the chaos is nonstop. Um, Jeff? The, the, the video that we just showed is just one example. It, it covers a myriad of, of different things that we could talk about, different talking points. So for starters, you have this particular video kind of geared more towards the response from fire rescue, law enforcement, okay? Um, but you saw it touch a little bit on, because uh, I, I break down these kind of incidents into three categories. You've got the response, which is going to be the people that are responding to that incident to, to fix it, make it better. You've got the people that are the victims. So that so if you're at your workplace, it could be just people who are doing their job, like at the airport, they talk about that. Obviously, there has to be some sort of response there. What do you do? How do you interact? And then thirdly, is gonna be the, the non-law enforcement or urgent, emergent responder folks that, that are part of that integral plan. So that could be like your unarmed security guards. That could be people at you know, check-in. It, it talks about so many things there, guys, like access control and, and you know, the, the see something, say something campaign. And sadly, uh, it also talks about the diversity of the, of the suspect. It could be somebody that is an employee. It could be somebody that is completely unknown to anybody that's off the radar. They just show up and, and start wreaking havoc. It could be somebody that is there as a customer, so somebody that is there for normal business. Um, and sadly, it could be one of your coworkers. So that's why there's just uh, so many things to talk about. Uh, but, but first and foremost, uh, the video definitely kind of should give you a snapshot of the response that you're going to expect. The biggest thing that I can tell you is if you're not part of that response, wherever you guys work at or whatever your role is, is make sure that you don't become an unintended victim. And what I mean by that is uh, if you saw in some of the little snapshots, you saw people walking out with their hands up, it's important that you guys comply with whatever those commands are at the scene. It's gonna be chaotic and people get upset because they feel like they're being treated like a suspect, but that's not the case. When law enforcement first arrives in that first initial, whatever you wanna call it, 60 seconds, five minutes, 10 minutes, they don't know who is who. And, and, and sadly, we've already seen in the Parkland incident, the suspect tried to blend in with students leaving the school. That is. I point to that incident to, to show to you that is why law enforcement does what they do. Everybody out with their hands up. So just do what they say and, and initially respond with that. They're going to start breaking things down. Obviously, they'll vet you. They may even search you, but they'll, they'll, they're going to vet you out and find out, okay, this is a friendly, this is a person coming out, maybe they saw something, maybe they didn't, and they kind of go in two different directions. Maybe you're going to be interviewed at a later time. To, to, to as to what you saw, or, and you may obviously be helpful in the uh, oncoming investigation that comes after that. But just remember, first and foremost, is keep yourself safe from whatever that response is, okay? And then secondly, which is, uh, we can touch on that with the run, hide, fight, what is, what, what can you do 
during that initial attack that's going to keep yourself safe, okay? Obviously, if you are a, a person in uniform, and I see several of those folks here, you guys obviously know what your plan is and what your response is and your protocols. Some places have armed security, some places have unarmed security. And then the other thing that we uh, have to operate within the confines of is, what am I permitted to bring to work? Probably the number one question that Paul and I get is, hey, I'm a lawful concealed carry permit holder. I, I have a firearm. You know, what are my options? And, and sadly, we have to always defer to, I don't know, what, it, what is your business or your company allow you to do. There are a lot of businesses that don't allow their employees to bring firearms or, or various weapons. So Paul and I try to do what we can to equip you with tools, tricks of the trade, techniques of how to keep yourself safe if you can't bring a firearm. Uh, you know, you hear people say, oh, well, I would have done this or I would have done that. Let me tell you, when bullets start cracking over your head, that's a game changer. And, and, and my default answer is, do whatever you have to do to keep yourself safe. So we're going to kind of delve into some of the things that you can, you can bring to the show, bring to work, or, or have on your person that might keep you safe. And uh, Paul brought some, some training aids, and then, the, and then sadly we'll even talk about some of the medical gear that you might be able to keep in your car, on your person, in a briefcase, in a purse, or at your desk that could potentially provide assistance to yourself or your coworkers um, after the incident happens. And then obviously some of the techniques. Run, hide, fight, which is DHS's program. Like I said before, guys, uh, YouTube, there's probably 50 videos that kind of uh, talk about individual little workplaces. They do a really good job in, I, I think most of those videos are five to 10 minutes long. They do a great job of kind of capturing, you, you kind of, you, your response is gonna fall into one of those three categories. You can run away from it, you can hide from it, or you can fight. And obviously if your assailant has a gun, or a, an edge weapon, your, your, your options are going to be a little bit limited based on what you carry, okay? So um, first and foremost, I, my big thing is situational awareness. That's the one thing that everybody can bring with them, no matter what your company policy is, is receive training like you're receiving today and do the best that you can to be aware of your surroundings. You would not believe how many incidents are thwarted because of that see something, say something campaign where we get called, hey, this car keeps circling around, or hey, there's a suspicious bag left by a garbage can, or this guy's asking <clears throat> weird questions about, you know, where are the magnetometers, or is that fence barbed wire, or is there cameras, so things like that. So bringing that situational awareness piece to the fight is, is in my opinion, kind of the first and foremost, because you, you may not be able to bring any items in. I know that there's even company policies now where you have to bring like a clear baggie into some places of business because they want to see what's going in and out of the business. So obviously, you're, some folks are really limited to what they can bring, but uh, there are a few things that, that nobody should have a problem with. And again, I'll reiterate this, please defer to your individual organization's company policy because some of them are very, very restrictive on what you can bring and some of them are a little bit more broader. But um, the one thing that we do uh, sometimes, and we've done it in this building for our non-sworn folks, is we will come to your place of business and we walk around with you and kind of point out, hey, this is a really good place to hide, and here's why. Or, hey, uh, there's a couple things that are typically in, in every building. I'll let you bring one of them out. Paul and I are a big advocate of uh, this particular piece of gear that's just about everywhere. Just real quick. Who can tell me what, would, what a good piece of improvised weaponry would be that's in every office building in this country? Fire That's a good class. Time to money. Ding. What does this do for you? It blinds them, it hurts them, it stops them. Wow, somebody's thought. I like that. <laughs> exactly. You know, I take that, I spray that in somebody's face, what do I have? I have standoff. I don't have to be on top of them to use it. Once I spray it, <clears throat> this is a bludgeon. I am going to beat that person's head into a pulp. And if, if you're not ready to take a life in a situation like that, reevaluate and don't even bother trying to fight because all you're going to do is get yourself killed. Hide or run. The priority, <clears throat> that run, hide, fight, that's a priority listing. You run first. You get out of there. You hide second behind locked doors. One other thing I'd like to bring up is what is the difference between 
The military and law enforcement talks about cover and concealment. Concealment hides you, but if somebody's shooting at you and they've got enough sense, this is not going to stop a bullet. Somebody could shoot me through this thing all day long. Okay? Those chairs, same thing. I need concrete block. I need steel. I need something heavy that's going to stop. That's cover. That'll keep you safe. Locking a door, if you're going to lock a door, barricade it shut, don't stand behind it. We've had a number of people shot standing behind doors. Barricade it, move away. All right? During, um, what was that, Virginia? University of Virginia, active shooter in one of the, in one of the buildings. The, the law enforcement folks that went in there breached 300 doors. Now, to you, that's okay, they opened up the door. No, I'm talking about guys taking a 30 to a 40 pound ram and having to beat a door in or beat it in with a sledgehammer to get in there to get people out because they had barricaded themselves in, all right? So do you open the door just because somebody knocks and says, hey, I'm a cop. Mm -mm. <laughs> they better be sliding a business card, they better be sliding credentials, they better be sliding something under that door. Don't take anybody's word for anything, all right? So, excellent piece of improvised weaponry. You know, chairs, chairs are kind of hard to throw, particularly a, an office chair with wheels on it. I don't know that I can pick that up and throw it at somebody. So, you gotta look around at what's there. You know, the um, scissors, another good weapon. Yeah, when you guys get back to your place of business, your office, your workspace, um, take a moment to look around and see what you have available to you, number one. Number two, come up with a good evacuation plan. Uh, guys, unfortunately, I, I'm here to tell you there's some really bad, bad people that, that, that think, die. I mean, it's, it's bad. For example, if somebody watches what your fire alarm plan is, and they see, hey, every time there's a fire alarm, everybody goes down this staircase, and they go to this area of the parking lot, somebody could use that technique of having everybody come out and then now you're all congregated in one area where they can plant an explosive device or somebody can be in the woods and, and sh fire down on your position where you're all pumped up. So those are kind of the things that you have to think about. Um, I'm a big advocate of alternating your fire plans. And, and usually you guys have somebody that kind of coordinates that like a safety officer and say, hey, what would be our second place to go in the event that there was a fire drill? And then that way you're doing it maybe every other time or two and then one. But that's just an example because you don't know um, what somebody's watching. So uh, if you've ever had a chance to see Dave Grossman, Google him, he, he, he teaches a lot of this stuff. I, I encourage uh, you to go to his eight hour class. He's written several books. There's one takeaway that uh, comes to mind uh, from his class. Every single attack in this case, he talks about terrorist attack, and, and a lot of these things clearly fall into the scope of terrorism. Every single terrorist attack starts with, with one thing in common, which is a pre-operational surveillance. Mm -hmm. What that means is the bad people that are planning an event, the first thing they do is they go to that place, they take pictures, they take video, they talk to people, they look on how can they get in, how can they get out. So that's kind of that moment where you might be able to intercept that attack under the see something, say something. So understanding your environment that you work in, understanding things like, hey, what is our fire plan? Where do we go? And then talking with your, and listen, some of you guys actually might be the security officer. So maybe you're sitting there taking notes. Geez, maybe we should change our fire drill plan. Um, How many but, folks in here are responsible for putting together a plan? Okay, the vast majority yeah. of you, okay. But the, just stuff like that, things to think about, um, you know, Paul and I talked about some of the things that are in your workspace uh, that may, you may be able to use as a weapon. The big thing, that, the other component of that is what, and, and help your employees identify what are some of the safe places to be. You know, Paul talked about the difference between cover and, and concealment. A big concrete pillar like this, this is a decent piece of cover, okay? There's a pretty good chance that that's gonna stop a bullet, but sadly people make drywall, like stuff like this, bullets go right through drywall. That's not, that's not cover. So fortifying your position, having a place where maybe like, you know, like the server room where there's no windows and only one way in, one way out, but walk around your space and find that. 
The downside to the high component of that is you might put yourself in a position where now you don't have any other options. If you put yourself like in a server room, there's no way out, and maybe you have limited tools. So just little things like that. Maybe you put things in the server room to help you sustain the fight. Um, but what Paul talked about it, the big thing is when the when the cavalry comes, they they don't know who's who. They're going to be breaching areas. They're going to be having people come out. They may even throw you out and have everybody get down on the ground with their hands. They may search you. They may bring you out. The other piece that this video talked about is on the medical side of it. Um, sadly, this is what the world we live in, but law enforcement and fire are basically taught now, if you can talk, if you can breathe, and you can move, they're going to go past you. They're not going to stop. They're going to tell you to get up and leave. They're going to drive on. The first priority when the cavalry comes, when that first initial set of law enforcement comes, is they're going to neutralize the threat. They will, they're sadly going to be stepping over bodies, and you may be trying to grab them and help me, help me, but they're going to go stop that threat. Hopefully that gets done quickly, like the LAX shooting, four minutes. That's pretty awesome. Sadly, you have the Navy Yard shooting an hour uh, and eight minutes before the, the uh, suspect was neutralized. So first thing is, what can you do to help yourself? Okay, so for example... A, a, a tent training, things like CPR training. They have like basic uh, uh, life safety uh, classes that you can take, like first aid. So one of the things that Paul and I also teach is what's called TACMED for law enforcement. Uh, that's stuff that, um, if you heard him talk about, they're kind of blending where police officers are learning medical and firefighters are learning kind of like tactics. And so they're trying to find that happy medium and where the, the, the group goes in together. But uh, being able to help yourself is, is, is kind of the, the starting off point, so self-aid. So some of the things that you can uh, hopefully bring to your place of business, I can't imagine anybody that wouldn't be allowed to bring things like gauze, a tourniquet, uh, trauma shears. There is a whole list of products. Um, Paul's got a whole bunch here to show you, but if you want to write these down, I can tell you there's, there's about three that are kind of like necessities, and I actually wear those on my ankle. They make pouches. This goes with me everywhere on and off duty. It holds a flashlight, okay? It holds a tourniquet. So that's the, uh, the thing, kind of, you know, we were probably all taught to use a belt, but they have different tourniquets now, okay? The tourniquet goes around an appendage like an arm or a leg to stop bleeding. And then, and then the last product is called a hemostatic. And basically, that's a fancy word for a, a bandage that has certain uh, properties that are like impregnated in it that are specifically designed to clot blood. Guys, we don't. I don't work for a company. I don't get paid by a company. If you want to ask me offline my opinion on stuff, I'll be glad to tell you. But there are phenomenal products out there. The soft tea tourniquet, the cat tourniquet. You've got quick clot. You've got Cheeto gauze. You've got Cellox. Hemostatic, number one. Number two, a tourniquet. And then number three is kind of up to you if you want to bring trauma shears, if you want to bring a pressure bandage. Uh, I bring a flashlight, and here's a trivia question for you. After 9-11, they, they did a bunch of studies like we always do when there's something like that. And one of the studies that they did is they asked all of the survivors, specifically from the World Trade Center, the folks that got out prior to the collapse, they asked them in a survey, and gosh, I think there was probably five or 6,000, so it was a pretty good you know, sample. They asked these folks, if you could have gone to work that day with one thing, what would you have brought with you? And the people administering the test said, oh my gosh, it's going to be parachute, <laughs> zip line, you know, uh, rappelling gear, st sat phone, stuff like that. I used to know the exact percentage. I don't anymore because 9-11 was a long time ago. But off the top of my head, it was in the 80 to 83 percent range. They said they would have brought a flashlight. Who would have thought a flashlight? It's freaking dark. Yeah. So um, that's one thing. You know, if you can't see, you can't do anything. Okay. And everybody thinks, well, I don't work the night shift. I work the day shift. Well, let me tell you right now. Look around this room. If I turn the lights out and I turn all of these computers off, you'll barely be able to see the, the hand in front of your face. So a flashlight's something to think about. There's a bunch of other stuff, and I'll be glad to talk about that offline. I don't want to, you know, take too much time talking about that specific thing. Paul's got some stuff here. Let me just address two other quick points. 
Um, see something, say something. You know, we hear a lot, well, you know, I, I would have said something, but I, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to, like, cause problems for somebody. I didn't want to seem, I didn't want to seem racist. We hear all that stuff. Look, that's what we get paid to do. All right? We get paid to vet those problems out. We get paid to find out who's, who's causing problems. My squad just arrested a guy two weeks ago, and what is this? This is the, yeah. Uh, we think he, he was planning on a shooting on the 19th. It would have been his, his parents and himself and some other people that he knew. Um, we arrested him. He is currently in jail, and he is receiving mental health care. All right, but let us let us take that burden off of you. All right, call, report the stuff. Let us know. For those of you that are, are responsible for setting up a plan, one of the things that they addressed was secondary devices. All right, do you have when you set up your assembly areas? Is it some place that anybody can drive a car into and park? Now, is there a bomb in that car? Is, are there trash cans nearby that somebody could put a bomb in and it explodes and now the whole trash can becomes shrapnel and tears people apart? So those are the kind of things as you're doing your planning, try to think about some of that stuff. This is a little less the tourniquet. Uh, I put this together, well, no, the tourniquet's in there. I put this together for one of our agents that was going to Columbia on a POS mission for her to put in her backpack. I mean, we have... We have these big bulky kits that we carry on our, on our vest. That's a quart Ziploc bag. There's about, there's about $50 worth of gear in here. But it covers, it covers just about everything. I'm not, again, I'm with Jeff. I don't make any money off any of this stuff, all right? Cellox is a brand. It's one of the hemostats that he was talking about. A cat tourniquet. These things, they go for about 22 bucks, but my caveat on all of this, don't just buy the cheapest thing out there. You're going to find cats that go for like 10 bucks. When you look for something, you want stuff that is buried, B-E-R-R-Y compliant. What that means is that stuff was made in the United States under, a, under DOD standards, all right? It, it can only be buried compliant if it's U.S. manufactured. You're going to find cats that are going to go for 12 bucks. They were made in China. You're going to put tension on them and they're going to fall apart on them. Okay? So very compliant. This is an Olus dressing. Again, there's an Israeli dressing. You'll hear people talk about Izzy dressings. It's just a different form of dressing. It has a big, bulky gauze on it and something that looks a lot like, you know, your standard ace wrap. Okay? Only it's a little, a little easier to put together. Ace wrap, a couple of four by fours, uh, an abdominal dressing. It's nice and bulky. Exactly the same thing. Cuts your cost way down. Bullet holes. I'm not trying to be rude here, but there's feminine products that work very well with bullet holes. All right, they're bulky. They stop bleeding. They can be pushed into into holes. Roller gauze, same thing. Take the gauze, it's gross. Take your fingers, stuff it into the hole. It stops the bleeding. Okay? Easy stuff that'll fill up fill up a quart bag. Can you put that in a backpack or throw that into your desk drawer? Piece of cake, it's there. Our protocol is if we're wounded, our trauma dressing, our gear, this is a military artifact. We carry something similar to this. Our IFAC gets used on us, not on somebody else. You use somebody else's stuff on them. You use your stuff on you, or somebody else uses your stuff on you. Okay? If the person that just patched you up gets, gets injured secondarily and they've used their stuff up, they're on it, you know, they're out of luck. Okay? So that's just some, some ideas of some stuff that you can use. Uh, any questions? Any questions about to see something, say something, or setting up uh, assembly areas? What was the name of that uh, ankle thing that you have on your ankle? There, guys, there's a there's a bunch of different products. This one's made by North American Rescue, but there's there's several. 
It's just basically like an ankle uh, sheet that's got uh, molly on there. If you're from the military, it's the pal's webbing. But all it is is Velcro pouches and things like that. You could probably make something homemade. That's just something that's easy for me to wear on my person, uh, on my ankle. It holds all the stuff. But like Paul said, th this, this wasn't cheap. This here is real cheap. And you can put some stuff in there and throw it in a briefcase, a bag, a purse. <laughs> One of the other things, uh, and, and every now and then we'll talk about this and folks are like, gosh, you're a little bit over the top or you're extreme. Does my child, that I have an eight-year-old, does she have body armor in her backpack? Absolutely. So in the body armor industry, unfortunately, one of the responses to active shooters is they have, it's kind of created this little niche for them. For the longest time, we've sold body armor to the military and police. Body armor, you'll also refer to as bulletproof vests. So you can buy now, anybody, online, ballistic armor. It's soft and flexible. It's the same stuff that police officers wear on their, on their body. Well, now they make various cut designs that fit in briefcases, purses, backpacks. Again, another layer of security. So you, you're bringing medical to, you know, maybe you're bringing medical to work. Maybe you've got, you've identified stuff, tools that you can bring or have that could potentially be weapons. And then thirdly, something like that, uh, you know, they, they have backpacks now that kind of unfold and cover the front and the back of you. So you carry what you need to carry to work, like your you know, your laptop, your whatever else, but now you have something, again, another layer of security that potentially could stop a bullet, okay? Um, uh, we don't like to use the word bulletproof. There's not a whole lot of things out there that are made that are bulletproof. We refer to it as body armor or ballistic armor. Um, do your research. Again, feel free to pick our brain offline. We'll be glad to kind of steer you in different directions, but they make different kinds of material that stop different kinds of bullets. And in, like everything that's out there, the kind of the you get what you pay for type of thing. But uh, a, a $70 piece of ballistic armor on your chest is better than nothing. So that's a, another thing that you could do to kind of create those layers of security. Yes, ma'am? Does it degrade? Is it something that you would have to, like, uh, over time replace? Yeah, so, so without making this a ballistic armor class, an excellent question. Typically, if it's what's called soft armor, so it's pliable, you have things like Kevlar and uh, Dyneema and all these different materials. Um, that stuff usually lasts about five years, but that is for liability purposes for police officers. And that's what I would tell people is that's what a police officer wears every day. Moisture is, is, is usually the, the, the enemy of those ballistic fibers. So if it's something that's kept climate controlled and it's in a, for example, a backpack, you, you're, 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 you're getting into like 10 and 15 years, but for liability reasons, body armor is typically uh, <laughs> listed uh, with a five-year expiration. But again, this is kind of what I tell people, because all the time I'll have people say, you know, my, my loved one was in the military and they brought a, a body armor home or whatever. Can I still use it? Well, let's talk about 10-year expired body armor, okay? It's 10 years old. Would you rather have that in front of you or nothing? So I would say, you know, even expired body armor is, is better than, but that's a, a very good question, so. And when you do your research with the, the various ballistic manufacturers, they'll talk about that. Um, hard armor, things like ceramic, steel, um, polyethylene, they have different kind of materials. What they refer to as hard armor, that usually has a longer period, usually 10 years, so. Any other questions on some of the stuff we talked about so far? I yes, sir. I noticed you haven't talked much about like people with guns, and uh, I have a lot of training just as a civilian with a lot of different organizations, and I can't tell you how many people I see purchase a gun with the concealed carry, and quite frankly, they don't know bleep about the yeah. gun. Well, let's okay. So let's let's just dive into that a little bit. So there are some places of business where you're permitted to bring a firearm. Maybe you have to keep it in your glove box. Maybe you're, you are able to carry it concealed if you have a concealed permit. So obviously, if you have the ability, the training, and you're lawfully carrying a firearm, you are on a little bit more of an even footing if, if, you, if you happen to find yourself in an active shooter attack. So some of the things to, to think about is, you know, obviously, we can't give legal advice on what to do. Uh, I will tell you this, if you decide that you're going to use a firearm to protect yourself or to stop the assailant, understand that when, when the cavalry comes, 
They, they may see somebody wearing blue jeans and a t-shirt and a ball cap holding a gun and you just got done defending yourself and all the police see is potentially another suspect. So if you're going to employ one of those techniques as, as, a, as a method to protect yourself, make sure that you know what the potential consequences are. So just make sure that you keep yourself safe when the cavalry does come. Um, and then the big thing is, and I will say this repeatedly because People sometimes will leave and say, yeah, the FDLE said we can carry a firearm. Always defer to what your company or your business policy is um, before you decide to you know, do something like that. We have more civilians in this building than we have sworn law enforcement. Our civilians are not allowed to carry into this building. Just to build on what you've been saying here, Jeff, it, the, we had the case in Orlando where a police officer shot someone or, you know, and then was killed by it. If, if I'm the person with the weapon, and I've just taken out the, the assailant, and law enforcement arrives, what is my best course of action? If you, if you feel like you have neutralized that threat, where, where, where you don't believe that they immediately pose a, 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 a risk to you, I would say holster that weapon and put your hands up. Okay. If you have time to make a phone call, or, or t you know, you tell Paul, go call 911. Make sure if there's any way to get out. Hey, I'm a lawful. You know, I have a CCW, whatever. I just shot the bad guy. I am wearing a blue collared shirt, blue slacks. I'm this. I'm that. I've got glasses. That might be that little bit of information. But I'm telling you right now, get your hands up. Right. They may, they may, if they get to you, they may put you down on the ground or whatever. Hey, let them do their thing. They'll figure it out real quick. Okay, bad guy, good guy, whatever. But. Uh, uh, sadly, law enforcement actually fall victim to what we call blue on blue more so than the general public with off-duty police officer. Orlando had the uh, UCF right. incident, right. gosh, probably 15 years ago. That's right. And if you are a police officer or military, they've kind of done some studies on this. And, and when, the, when the cavalry comes, police officers and even military members, they have a hard time realizing when they hear police yelling, drop the gun, they're talking to you. Right. And, and that doesn't click. That you know, you're thinking, oh, I'm one of the good guys. So that's why I say, if you can secure it, put it away, get your hands up, uh, let let them do their thing. They may put you down on the ground. They may search you, whatever. They may even handcuff you. Let them do their thing. They'll sort it out. It doesn't take too long. You know, five, ten minutes, they're going to realize, all right, this is what we have. Bad guy, good guy. Okay, they'll start interviewing witnesses. So all very, very, very good questions, guys. One other thing you notice though. Um, the naval yard, a lot of folks coming out wearing their backpacks. My suggestion to your people would be leave the backpacks behind. Because all you're going to do is slow up. They're going to search you. I'm going to guarantee you if they, if they don't search you, they're wrong. All right? They're going to search you. The more you leave, if the less stuff they have to go through, the faster you're out of there. You're gonna, they're going to let you go back into your place of business and pick up your backpack later. But try to keep that what has to be searched to a minimum. I, I, I'm glad that you guys raised your hand earlier. I did not realize that, that our class was comprised that heavily of people that are in that kind of that responsibility role. One of the other things, a training that you guys can seek out is what's called SITPED, Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design. That's the acronym, SITPED, Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design. They have classes that are online. They've got classes you can pay and take. I, I actually went to the 40-hour certification class 19 years ago. I can kind of dumb it down in five minutes or less. There are things that you can do at your place of business to make yourself not a soft target. That's the word you'll hear them use. Multiple layers. They, absolutely, multiple layers of security. So number one, lighting. When it's dark out, do you have good lighting? Are the trees trimmed? What kind of lighting do you have? Are there any shadows, things like that? Do you have cameras? Do they traverse? Does, it, does this camera cover a whole area or does it just sit pointing this way? Guys, I'm telling you, bad guys are coming to your place of business and they are looking at what your countermeasures are. Now, it may be just because they want to commit a burglary or break into a car or whatever, but sadly it could be because they want to victimize a person or commit an attack. So like you just said, you create layers. So lighting is one thing, perimeter control. Whether that be a fence, are you using barbed wire, are you using things like um, uh, access cards? You know, what, is it RFD, is it, is it uh, Hirsch pad, swipe, all those things like that. 
Does that card have a picture on it? Again, you're creating layers. I know a lot of businesses will use a swipe card, but they don't put a picture on it, so that means they could commit a burglary, steal that, that uh, quote, employee ID, and now they have that white little card that gets them in and out. So, you know, we're, in here we're required to wear the photo ID out. That, again, another layer of security. Um, do you have people at checkpoints? Do you have any kind of access control? Do you have armed or unarmed guards? The biggest thing that can happen to your place of business is uh, what they call a pass-through or a hitchhiker. So you have all these great tactics employed in keeping your business safe. And your employee walks up, they buzz in, maybe they even have to hit a, a punch code. They open that door, they look behind them, and they see somebody holding stuff, maybe they've got groceries, maybe they've got, hey, I need a hand or whatever, and now you just let somebody in. That person at that point has now defeated all of your layers of security because your employee wasn't maybe properly trained. So make sure your folks understand if there is a system in place, you have to follow it, okay? Um, but but if, if you're in one of those uh, managerial roles or responsibility roles, um, that, that certification or that program is pretty good. And it gets really down in the weeds on, if I remember correctly, we talked for four hours about light bulbs. This one does this, and this one is white versus high vapor and yada yada. But uh, I even remember they talked about how you trim your bushes near windows, making sure there's not shadow areas, um, just all kinds of stuff like that. So um, the best thing that you can do is, uh, the, in the government, they, they call it red cell. They basically create these group of people, and their job is to kind of pick apart whatever your defensive posture is and to think outside the box. For example, prior to 9-11, everybody thought if there was going to be an incident on a plane, it would, it would be a hijacking. Sadly, we didn't know that they were going to use aircraft as, as you know, weapons of mass destruction. So basically what you do is you have like a, a counterpoint where I go to Paul and say, hey, Paul, this is my security plan for protecting this house or this whatever. And then Paul says, well, did you think about somebody parachuting in? Did you think about somebody using a drone to carry an explosive? And that's when you, oh man, I didn't even think about that. What can we do to combat that? If you notice, drones has really like been the latest craze and there's people finding ways to use drones you know, for nefarious purposes. So how do you mitigate that threat? Um, there's just, uh, sadly, if you know, what's the proverbial, if there's a way to do it or you know, pull off an attack, they'll think about it. Question in the back? So, and it, sometimes they're free too. Um, SEPSI over in St. Pete, uh, they have like a public se safety academy. That's where I took my class. I don't know if it's still offered, but it was a 40 hour class back then. It was a great class. I mean, it really got deep in the weeds on what you can do to set up those layers of security for your specific building, you know, house, whatever that case may be. Yes, sir. One of the problems with all of these plans is they can be undermined by humans, as you so aptly point out. I mean, uh, at the Parkland shooting, what did he do? He pulled the alarm. The moment that alarm went off, all doors and entrances, gates, all had to open immediately, which gave him a sense and ability to get out. But likewise, if you had a co-conspirator, not even realizing why, they pull the alarm, it gives you access in. I mean, we hear about this sort of thing all the time. We've got to figure out a way to be more effective with the see something, say something, because to react, we're really on our own. I mean, when we realize that from the moment of commitment, when a person decides to pull their weapon, to when the first round is discharged is just two seconds. Security, no matter how well armed, no matter how well trained, uh, are not gonna be on scene in two seconds. So we're on our own. Very well put, and there's a bunch of different spin-offs from that. So, uh, if you're from the military, you've heard the adage, you know, no, no good plan survives first contact. So basically you can do all these things and then you're like, well, that didn't work out or this, this happened. So, you know, you do the best you can to protect yourself. You do the best you can to equip yourself and train yourself. 
And then the big thing is making sure that all of your employees or the people that you work with have that knowledge base to protect yourselves. But guys, uh, I've heard people kind of laugh to see something say something, and, and, and Paul kind of touched on it. Sadly, in this politically correct work world, I've heard people come to me and go, well, I didn't want to say this because of, you know, of the this or that. I'm telling you right now, pick up the phone, make that anonymous complaint or, or, or tip, and it would be, I cannot, I don't know how I could live with myself if I saw something, hey, that guy was surveilling the parking lot yesterday, and then, God forbid, something happens the next day. So, do what you can to tr make sure that your folks are vigilant in creating that situational awareness. I mean, I, we teach things like, you know, um, unarmed self-defense. Uh, the biggest thing that you'll see is you go to the mall and people come out of the mall, they're walking to their car like this, or they're doing this, and they've got their shopping bags. Complete lack of situational awareness. So that's and what happens. The vehicle gets, you know, hijacked, or they, they someone steals their bag. So having your head on a swivel and being aware of your surroundings. Yes, ma'am. And I'm sorry if you mentioned this already. Being aware of your surroundings doesn't mean not being able to work because you have disgruntled employees, people that may be fired or terminated, and they come back. You recognize their face, you remember the situation that they cause harm to the people that they work with. So even within your own organization, you have to be vigilant about who is in your space. Guys, very, very sadly, we obviously just had this tragedy with, with the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. If, if you didn't see a, a deputy suffering some, some, from some sort of PTSD, uh, killed his entire family and then took his life. Um, it, it, and I just learned something last night from the news. I did not know that law enforcement has a 6.5 time higher level of suicide rates I had no, I mean, six and a half times. That's a huge number. And I think uh, if you if you notice, the chief from Aurora talked about it. Yeah. He said we had to keep our eyes on officers. So obviously that's just the specific sector of law enforcement. You have horrible PTSD issues in, in military members. Guys, be good to your coworkers. Look out for one another. If you see somebody going through something, a difficult time, reach out, ask questions. And, 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 and guys, the other thing too is, most companies, to include the state of Florida, they actually have an outstanding EAP system where you can get help uh, for free or, or whatever part of your employee program. But uh, the biggest thing is if you're going through something like that, don't be afraid to ask for help. And if you see someone around you that you work with, don't be afraid to say, hey, are you, are you okay today? Is, can I, is, is there anything I can do for you? Especially uh, if you're in a management role, you know, you got to kind of monitor your folks. But um, that's the big thing, guys, is obviously mental health. We could talk about, we could make a 40-hour class on mental health as it relates to these active shooter incidents. But um, keep an eye on your folks. Keep an eye on yourself. That Paul's one. Yes? You know, I'd like to tap into something else. As we make our plans, uh, you've been on the front line. I like to believe I can do what you do. Probably can't because of what, what you do. But you bring up a point about evacuations and secondary devices. So when we're putting the plan together for, let's say, an office complex, multiple floors, let's say predominantly women, should the emphasis be on staying and barricading yourself, or should it be evacuated? I know there's no clear answer here, but knowing that you've been there, and you're arriving at the scene, and there's people slowing out, should the emphasis be on what? Or should we begin somewhere with what? Is that identifying the places where they can evacuate and barricade until law enforcement shows up? Or should we put the evacuation in at the same time? I think I can answer that for you to the best of my ability. And guys, there are so many examples, the what ifs, but I will tell you, we have a mantra in our line of work. I was on the, the governor's protection squad for seven years. We have a saying, which is get off the X. What that means is if something bad is happening right here, right now, get away from that. Go away from that. Don't be near that. I think Paul said it in the initial, if you can run, run. We don't know how what's going to play out. Paul, sadly, is a, is a horrible example of people who 
kind of herded themselves into a bathroom and were hoping for the best, and it didn't, didn't work out for them. And I am not saying anything disparaging about any of those victims. I was there. I saw it. It's horrible. It makes me sick. But I will tell you, my best advice to you is get away, run. That would be the first option, leave. Now, you talk about you know, shelter in place. The problem with shelter in place is sometimes people will start merging the threat, for example, like a hurricane, a tornado, a fire, or, 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 or whatever. And, and obviously company policy comes into play there. But I would say if there's somebody in your building trying to hurt you, get away, run away. Let me tell you right now, it's really darn hard to shoot a moving target. That's, that's, that's the cold hard truth. If, if you are running as fast as you can, preferably, preferably not in a straight line, you're, it's going to be really hard for somebody to, to, to hit you with a bullet. That's, those are the facts. I wish I could give you that if this, then that, but there are so many examples of what if there's multiple assailants? What if they surrounded the building? What, you know, uh, Eric Rudolph, if you guys don't remember Eric Rudolph, uh, the abortion bomber, one of the things that he did in Atlanta is he called in a fire alarm at an abortion clinic and he watched from the woods on exactly how the fire response was. He did it twice and he noticed they responded exactly the same way. Fire engine pulled here, battalion chief pulled there, ambulance went over here. He put a secondary device where they were setting up their quote command post, okay? First bomb goes off, kills a police officer, and I believe a nurse, or maybe it maimed her, but that was that initial incident that drew everybody in. And what he did not know, and you talk about Murphy actually working out for, for us, which is rare, a garbage truck had dumped a dumpster not in the exact position that it was supposed to be in, and the bomb ended up being a little bit shielded by that dumpster, which no one could have ever accounted for. When the device went off, and if you go to YouTube, it's on, it was, the media was there and captured it. When the bomb went off, the dumpster basically redirected a lot of the energy, and they had some first responders get hurt, but nobody got killed. And the bomb guys that did the post-blast investigation said if that dumpster hadn't have been there, it had killed 20 firefighters. So um, there's an example of what we talked about, that pre-attack surveillance. So making sure that you have a plan, that you vary your plan. Um, the, the Aurora movie theater, that guy had devices in vehicles outside and in his uh, house. You had the Columbine attack, which kind of started all this stuff. Those two guys had uh, put uh, improvised devices out in the parking lot. So I'm telling you right now, the mode is to kind of get you looking this way and then hurt you from over here. Yes, ma'am. If you cannot run, can you play dead? Do you recommend playing dead? Is there any problem with playing dead? That's a, that's a tough one. So is it an option? Yes. Um, you are really painting yourself into a corner at that point, okay? Meaning you don't have any options left. So if you decide to play dead, now you're on the ground, you know, you're huddled up, whatever. You, you run the risk of that person that attacker coming back and delivering fatal shots and, and, and without getting too much into like the crime scene, I will tell you, I know for a fact on one of the places I've been, that was the technique, which was shoot as many people as the, that particular attacker could, I'm trying to not get into specifics here, that attacker then went back and delivered coup de grace shots to the head. So also in, kick some folks kick folks to try and get some kind of response to see if they were in fact dead or not. So if you decide to use that technique, when, he, when the attacker kicks you or comes up with a pistol or a rifle, you have no options now. So I would say, you know, maybe try and steer towards the run, hide, fight. But again, guys, you know what? I hear people armchair quarterback all the time. Anytime there's an attack or an active shoot or any mass casualty event, well, I would have done this. I would have taken my car and driven, you know, run them over. I would have taken it. Guys, I don't, it's real easy to say that when you're sitting at home on your you know, recliner watching TV. This is what I say. This is my response to that. Do what you have to do to go home safely to your loved ones. Whatever, that, whatever that is. It's a legitimate technique, and it saved more than a few lives. All right? 
But just be careful of, like Jeff said, of painting yourself into a corner where you, you know, you don't have any other options. I think I had a hand back here I missed a little while ago. Anybody in the back? Yeah, it was me. Okay. say to that in, in very broad strokes as an employer uh, every company has their own uh, mechanism of like a background investigation or some sort of a process where they get vetted out um, obviously I don't know what your particular one is but I would say that as long as you're not picking on one person so I'll, all I can talk about is my background because I, I don't work in the private sector in our background you do have to do a psychological exam with a with a psychiatrist you have to see a doctor. They do a very invasive background check, you know, checking your record, things like that. So I can tell you this. If a record is, ex is expunged, it's expunged. You can't see it. I can't see it. If, if you're seeing something, I'm, guys, there's hundreds of companies that you can hire to do things like criminal records checks. You know, you pay for that. And that's, again, I can't give you kind of like legal advice on that. But if you're seeing an incident like on a, like a criminal record, and it's it's there. It's not expunged because and, and they, they you know I don't want to tell you to hire or not hire somebody, but I mean if it's expunged, you can't see it. If you can see it on a criminal records check, it's there. Now, do people get falsely arrested? Sure. Do, 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 and usually there's an explanation for that. And one of the things that you'll see uh, from from legal jargon would be no information filed or no prost which means somebody got arrested, okay? And then when, 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 that, when that particular incident made its way through the legal system, the legal system said there's not sufficient evidence to proceed with a, you know, with a trial. I would encourage you to get with your general counsel or get with an attorney, a business attorney, to, to get that kind of information, but that's the, the best I can do for, for that question. The other thing is, is that Florida has an extremely broad public records law. And once a criminal case is closed, it falls under public record. So you do have the option of going back to the original agency and requesting, and unless there is some exemption from that public records law, that, that report's releasable. All right, and particularly if you go there and you explain to them why you're concerned, you'll probably get... And he's probably okay, but... But again, we're back to, you know, let somebody, let somebody that's getting paid to do that vetting vet it, okay? I mean, it, you know, if you're sitting there with, if you've got concerns, you're seeing something, the hair standing up on your neck, the, every time you talk to this guy, you might want to dig a little deeper. <laughs> You know, based on, I'm just trying to give you some other ways around this thing if you're not comfortable with them, all right? And I, I really can't, you know, like Jeff had the best point, talk to your, uh, to your general counsel or whoever, you know, whoever they have on retainer to represent you folks and, and try and work it out with the attorneys. I had a question right here. I, I had a comment. When you're running, keep running. <laughs> Don't just go out the door and stop yeah. and gaggle around. Keep going until you get to a law enforcement guy and they're between you and where the 
stuff was going on. You know, the other thing when you're running, when you're when you're running, I mean, I agree with you. Get that. Get as far away as you can. But don't just, you know, the situational awareness. Run from one point of cover to another point of cover. Listen. Look. Run from one point of cover to another point of cover. Yep. Once you're out of the building, then become the track star and get the heck out of there. And then a, a question: You guys are seeing these bad guys on a regular basis. Are they very good shots? <laughs> it depends. <laughs> uh, you know, I know you guys are. You know. So I, I would say that it's such a broad scope of of your bad guy, your actor, from people who. You know the proverbial prey and spray. They're just shooting a gun in a direction. Uh, again, another video to watch: the, the the shooter in Dallas that killed all the police officers uh, during that. Um, I think it was a parade or a, a protest, whatever. But that particular person had significant prior military training. Mm -hmm. And when I watched the video, there's not a lot the police officers could have done. If 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 you have a pistol and your bad guy has a rifle and they have prior training. You are so far behind the power curve. Um, so sadly, yeah, there are people who have that training, and, and you know we're trying to prepare you for the worst. But you know, obviously, if, if if somebody were to walk into this room right now with a handgun or a rifle, there, there there's going to be victims just by the how we're clustered together. So you know, we we see attacks that happen that are contact distance. You know, right. somebody walks into an office building. And, you know, the Charlie Hebdo attack was horrible. That was, you're talking from me to you. I don't have to know how to shoot a gun, right? right? Then you've got the complete opposite end of the spectrum. Sadly, you know, Pulse at one time was sadly the highest body count active shooter incident. Now Vegas was, I think, with what, 58? Mm -hmm. You're talking hundreds of meters away in a, a high position where they didn't know where that was coming from. And, and had multiple rifles, okay? Um, so there's an example where that person was just shooting and traversing that rifle just over a crowd of people and just basically raining bullets down on the crowd. And there's, you know, that, so there's another thing that probably nobody ever, well, gosh, what happens if somebody gets in a, in a hotel or a, 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 high, a high point and fires down onto an open area like that. Imagine a concert or a football field. You know, there's so many examples. Yes, sir? Uh, actually, getting on that, when we're on the subject of multiple different ways, if you go on YouTube and look up active self-protection, they put out something daily on victims and crime and all that stuff. And they just go over a few points of what happened, what could we do better, stuff like that. Yeah, guys, that, look, unfortunately, they, there are a lot of these incidents to pick apart. There's going to be more in the future. It's just the, the, the world that we live in. Um, all you can do is every time something like that happens, we, law enforcement, that's what we do. We look at that and we say, what could we have done better? What did we learn from it? What are, are, are there things that we didn't think of or that we weren't going to see? So obviously now, people are, you know, Disney. There's a perfect example. Uh, there was a time where Disney World wasn't scanning guests coming in and out of the hotels. You can't bring a firearm now into a Disney World hotel. Not just the parks. You can't have it on their footprint. They brought in the magnetometers. They have dogs that detect gunpowder. So there is an example of one company that kind of uh, pivoted to the threat. And I think that was a direct correlation to the Vegas attack. Are they providing what? proper security now that I'm a defenseless nobody? Guys, listen, you know, I, we, we can't make it a, a, a legal. I'm a police officer. I carry a gun for a living. Okay? That, it's my job to carry a pistol. I'm paid to carry a pistol and a firearm. I don't like being without my pistol. Um, if you're a lawful you know, gun owner, whether that be with a concealed weapons permit or you're just, you know, you're, you're uh, expressing your Second Amendment rights, there's going to be a time where you may not have the tools that you want. As a police officer, I can't get on an airplane off duty and fly with a gun. I don't like it. There are certain government buildings in D.C. that I can't bring a firearm into. There are certain government buildings in Florida like the Pinellas County Courthouse, that I can't bring a, on duty, can't bring a firearm. So 
we all have to work within the confines of where we were, what our company policy is, what all those things like that. I can tell you this, when I, whenever I'm not without a firearm, I have something else that I'm legally allowed to carry. Um, I try to you know, make sure that I get as best training as possible. And the one thing that I carry all the time, no matter where I go, is a flashlight and that little ankle kit. Uh, if, if I have to use my hands to defend myself, I will. But um, if I can render aid to myself or somebody who gets injured, then that's why I carry these things. So. Real quick on, on the skill level thing, uh, Jeff talked to about a guy by the name of Dave Grossman. Yeah. Grossman made reference to a shooting that happened, I believe it in Kentucky, in a school where the shooter never deviated more than five degrees off his line of fire. Paducah. He learned, Paducah, Kentucky, he learned to shoot off a video game. Yeah. Video game, what do I do? I point at a TV screen, I point at some kind of a screen, and I don't have to deviate more than 5%. And if I'm not mistaken, like the janitor knocked the kid down and stopped the shooting. All right? <clears throat> so you've got a lot of that coming into play, too. And some of those folks just off those games get pretty doggone accurate. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Just a comment. Uh, I was active duty for 22 years. And then I worked for the military for 18 years after that before I retired. You couldn't have a weapon. You couldn't have a knife. You couldn't have maids, you couldn't have anything. But I always had a can of corn spray on my desk that would shoot up to 25 feet. And I can't tell you how many people came in and joked me about, what, you think there's hornets in this room? And I go, well, you know, we've had bees come in my casing unit before, so I just want to, you know, be able to protect myself from them. And that's what, even why I had the horn spray. What a, what a great way to think outside the box. I like it. It's stuff like that, guys. Uh, since you brought it up, I'll tell you this. If you decide to carry pepper spray, and you will hear it referred to a, bu a bunch of different names, chemical <coughs> spray, uh, OC spray, whatever, pepper spray, um, guys, do your research and make sure you're buying the right stuff. Unfortunately, most of the stuff that's sold commercially is not uh, what law enforcement carries, which is uh, oleoresin capsicum, which is truly put pepper spray. And some of the chemical stuff that you, mace is probably the biggest term or word that I've heard out there. They've done studies with mace, and basically all you're really doing is really, you're, you're upsetting your attacker at that point. <laughs> I'm, I'm being serious. So um, if you decide, and that's, that's a great technique, uh, is carrying some sort of a chemical munition, but if you're allowed to carry something like that, do your due diligence and get pepper spray. It'll tell you right on the label. You can. There's again. I'm not make. I don't get paid for this, but there's law enforcement stores where the public sector can buy it. You can probably get it online. But what you're looking for is the actual oleo resin capsicum. That is the, the the cayenne pepper. That stuff works not on everybody, but on certain people. I've even seen now that they sell tasers to, to civilians. Tasers are the electronic conductive weapons that shoot darts, uh, kind of like a stun gun, except it has a standoff. So there are a whole myriad of tools and, and, and things that you could potentially buy to, to, to protect yourself. Um, there's a really good one called a monkey fist. Uh, I saw that and I thought the person who told me about it was joking. It really is, that's what it's called. It's a, a little bit of shock cord and I, it's some sort of a, of a, a hard ball. Made, I don't know if it's steel or plastic and then it's wrapped in, um, I, is that one right there? There you go. So, will you hold that up kind of nice and high? There you go, guys, right there. Let me tell you right now, now granted, you're talking about that much distance, but uh, the, the, the friend of mine that's in law enforcement, he had bought that for his spouse, and he was showing me, and I kind of did it just for, and I'm telling you right now, I, yes, I was like, okay, you have my attention. So, again, just something that, you know, you may be able to utilize, you, again, check with your company policy or whatever, but you have to think outside the box. Yes, sir. Another good self-defense weapon, they make uh, pens. Yep. Yep. So he's talking about pens that kind of have uh, more than one use. They have ones that have like edge weapons. They have ones that are like striking devices. Uh, actually, uh, again, I'm, I don't get paid, but Surefire makes a flashlight, not this one, that has a bezel on it that's gnarled. So if you take that flashlight and you hit somebody, it's uh, it's almost like brass knuckles, but with like little ridges. And so again, just another way to, to potentially skin that cat. 
Guys, these are all excellent questions and comments, and please take advantage of Paul and I's Yeah, I'd like to start wrapping this up. We're getting down to our bewitching hour of, of 12 noon. We're going to stick around as long as we got questions if you want to go one-on-one -on -one with us. I'd like to give John a, a couple of minutes to speak to the program that, that he uh, works on. And then uh, Nicholas needs to address a few things, and then, then we'll, we'll call it a day. But like I said, we're going to be here. We'll show you what we got, and we'll be more than happy to, to answer any one-on-one -on -one questions you have after this. Thank you, Paul. My name is John Burns. That's B-Y-R-N-E-S. I'm with the Center for Aggression Management. We have a free instructional video on our website that I would like to have you uh, focus on. The website is www.aggressionmanagement.com and if you'll just scroll down to you where you see the CAPS instructional video. What we've heard here today is excellent. We're learning how law enforcement and first responders are working together to maximize the result, but we live with a hard truth. The hard truth is that from the moment of commitment, that's when a person decides to pull their weapon and start shooting, to when the first round is discharged is just two seconds. Law enforcement, security, no matter how well equipped or trained, are not going to be on scene in two seconds. We've got to get out in front of it. We keep hearing about this. We developed a system, we started developing it 25 years ago, we scientifically validated it seven years ago, and it's described fully in that video that I'm referring you to. It talks about how and why it works and why current systems are not working as effectively as we want it to. Why is see something, say something not working like we would like it to work to? Because humans tend to do what they believe is in their best interest. They don't see getting involved as in their best interest, so they don't. Our, the objective is what the FBI and the, and the Secret Service call the path to violence. That's what we discovered 25 years ago, the sequential successive precursors to violence, which enable us to identify someone on that path. Look at the video. Uh, it'll give you some meaningful skill sets right there. And then if we can help in any way, please reach out to us. We'll describe it to you, help you in any way we can. Thank you. Thank you. that website again. What's that? Website again. www.aggressionmanagement.com. Aggression has two G's, incidentally. Aggressionmanagement.com. We'll find it real easy there. And it just go down and look for CAPS instructional video. CAPS? CAPS, C A P S. It's the Critical Aggression Prevention System, CAPS. Thank you. Since you're jotting down, the other one that I would uh, just circle back and talk about early is uh, whenever you get a chance, uh, get on YouTube, and uh, it's the Run, Hide, Fight. Uh, I, I actually Googled it this morning just to see the responses. There's like 20 videos, and what's neat is you can kind of find one that might fit your little niche. Like, they have one for an office building, they have one for a hospital. So uh, go online, um, they're about five to seven minutes long. It's real quick, easy, uh, down and dirty, kind of the DHS model, which is run high fight. So more good information. Uh, it's real quick, if you are considering purchasing or owning or carrying a gun, I highly recommend from Asud Ayub. I, I know you guys know his name. Yeah. I want to thank, especially to Paul, Edwin, and Jeff Rowe for conducting this workshop. Very useful. Hey, um, yeah. oh, we'll go. <laughs> they've covered some very useful strategies to keep your workplace safe as well.